About one in six women suffer from a condition which can profoundly affect their lives. Yet many of them don't know what's wrong. And when they see their doctor, they often fail to get the right diagnosis and treatment. When I was about 16, um, I did notice a fairly dark patch of hair um, on my chest. Um, that was probably the first sign, even though um, at the time I wasn't aware of the condition at all. Um, and I do remember mentioning it to my GP, but it was brushed off as nothing important and go wax it. Go wax it? Mm hmm Professor Helena Teed of the Jean Hales Foundation in Melbourne is an internationally recognised expert in this condition. Unfortunately, we know in Australia that the journey to diagnosis is too long and is suboptimal, and there are many reasons for that. Um, one, women often don't recognise the features of the condition, so they don't present for help. Two, when they do present, often they may just present as an adolescent with irregular cycles, may not be appropriately assessed, popped on the pill, and they often stay on the pill for contraceptive reasons for quite some period of time. It's not until they come off when they are looking at having a family that they are actually diagnosed. Um, and also, it's been a complex evolving area, so keeping the, the primary care physicians and the healthcare providers and consumers aware of the changes in evidence and the new diagnostic criteria that have occurred in more recent times is challenging. What we're talking about here is a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS. And in fact, the name itself perpetuates a myth because it doesn't involve real cysts on the ovary. It's a hormonal problem and it's an interplay in a woman between her genes, what she's been born with, and her lifestyle in terms of inactivity and her eating habits. Obesity is common in women with PCOS, and their body doesn't respond very well to the sugar-lowering hormone insulin, which comes from the pancreas. That means that insulin levels go up, and that affects blood pressure and blood fats. For reasons that people don't fully understand, the excess insulin also stimulates the ovaries to produce too much of the male hormone testosterone. The eggs in the ovary are controlled by hormones that come from a part of the brain called the pituitary gland. In some women with PCOS, that control goes wrong, and a chemical messenger called luteinizing hormone stops eggs from maturing and being released, which affects the woman's periods and her fertility. The clinical features that are well recognised now include psychological features, so women with PCOS are more likely to have anxiety, depression, poor body image, low self-esteem and also uh, impaired quality of life. There are the well recognised reproductive features, so we have a situation where many of the eggs in the ovary partly develop but don't actually ovulate. They look like cysts on an ultrasound but they're not actually cysts they often, women often have irregular menstrual cycles and that's one of the most easy to recognise of the symptoms and because of that and the lack of ovulation they have impaired fertility. Um, there are also uh, other reproductive problems with high androgen or male type hormone levels and the key things are increased body hair and increased facial hair and on occasion um, scalp hair loss much like male pattern balding. And then there's the final group of features which have only been recognised more recently and they're what we call the metabolic features. So an increased risk of diabetes, both diabetes in pregnancy and, and type 2 diabetes, increased cardiovascular risk factors, increased propensity to weight gain. What happened after that? Um, the next few years carried on as, as normal. Um, hair was still an issue, um, weight has always been an issue. Um, I've never had much success losing weight or even maintaining my weight. So it was a gradual increase over throughout my teenage years. And it was only until I was about 19 that I started to have menstrual irregularities and that was worrying enough to send me back to the GP to be investigated further. And what did the GP do? Um, luckily it was a different GP this time who was aware of the condition and by this stage I was aware of the condition having read about it in the media and was able to tick many of the symptoms off um, myself. The diagnosis is, is actually again a little complex but really women have to have two of three key features that is irregular menstrual cycles, um, what we call 
cysts, but as I said, are actually half developed eggs on ultrasound when we do an ultrasound of the ovary, or increased male type um, hormones, which can be detected either in the blood or, as I said, with excess hair growth. So the impact of PCOS on my life during my teenage years um, and around my time of diagnosis um, was very much an emotional um, impact. Um, I was very emotionally unstable. <laughs> um, I'd never cried so much in my whole life. I didn't feel like I could cope with a lot of things. Um, and that, that was a really um, tough time leading up to my diagnosis and it was only after I was diagnosed that um, I discovered that that was all part of the syndrome. The symptoms affected me then that still affect me now. Um, the excessive hair growth is quite demoralising and it's tough to have to deal with. Being overweight and classified as obese, those symptoms have this negative connotation within today's society and we've got these, they've got a horrible stigma attached to them. So when you have PCOS and you're not in control of all of them all the time. That has a very, um, it's, it's tough. If you don't manage the anxiety and depression, if you don't manage the impact of illness on their life first and get them to a phase where they're ready and able to change, you're unlikely to succeed long term. And what about exercise, diet and that sort of thing, what have you found with that? So our research and the research of others largely suggest that really it's about the total caloric intake, not about whether it's low GI or high GI or low protein or high protein. So there are no specific secrets. And the other thing is in terms of exercise, the benefits are very substantial. So that um, an increase in physical activity, even without any change in weight, can make quite dramatic differences to insulin resistance, improve hormone profiles, restore regular menstrual cycles. Overall, weight loss has a very profound effect on this condition, and it doesn't need to be dramatic weight loss. So irrespective of a woman's starting weight, if they're only to lose three to 5% of their body weight, sometimes up to 10%, they can get very dramatic improvements. And that's a, a very important message for women to know small changes in lifestyle that are sustainable, small weight changes, very big health impact. And how much exercise do you recommend? Because Jean Hills has been pushing it quite hard. Yes, so um, the research that we've done has been three fairly intensive exercise sessions per week. So that was achieving what we were trying to do in terms of getting close to maximal heart rates and, and making sure that women were getting reasonably vigorous exercise three times a week. But that was also on a background of 30 minutes a day of recommended exercise. With PCOS um, and our current research, as well as research around the world, the recommendation is to, to attempt to get at least 90 minutes of your weekly exercise in the form of more vigorous activity. There are also medications that can help a woman with PCOS. Two of the main ones are called metformin and clomiphene. And there are pros and cons about each, depending on an individual woman's circumstances. Professor Helena Teeds has led a group of people, including women with PCOS, who've developed clinical guidelines on the condition. And they're available for health professionals and women. We'll have a link to them on our website, tonictv.com.au.